So this is class 11, <clears throat> and in this class we are going to get started on a few classes here where we'll be talking about health care and health insurance. Um, <clears throat> it's pretty extensive, there's a lot of issues, and so what I want to do first is this is very, very important so that you utilize your time in watching these classes so you can both be doing your class notes and, in, you know, and learning and, and observing and even calling me and debating and discussing, but you can also be preparing your paper, paper two. Paper two is a very extensive paper, so it would be really good if you could get half the paper written while you're doing listening to the class. So the first thing we'll do is we'll walk through the rubric so you know the, the types of things we're looking for so you can be on the lookout for them. You should always have that rubric out in front of you anytime you're going through these articles. We'll hit the first two articles, which are very foundational type of articles. They really set the stage. They go at high level of some issues that in other articles will go on a much deeper level. Um, but what you want to do is make sure you have the articles I'm discussing, have them loaded. So I have the first two articles for tonight, so you should have both of them up on your computer with the rubric. Now, as I talked last time, you might the rubric is in Excel you might want to convert that rubric and put it into a Word document. Um, I don't think Excel would be the best um, engine for, for collecting this. You might be able to copy and paste what's in Excel and paste it over to, uh, to Word. And then as we go through these articles, type notes under the different categories. So that's why you have to know the different parts of the outline, which is pretty extensive. Um, and I'll help you as we go through the articles. I'll let you know. Yeah, that's in the that's in the outline under problems at the very top or near the near the bottom. Uh, so if you need to pause the video, you can copy and paste a really good quote in on that section, or just type your notes. What did we talk about? What were the articles saying? Put it into your own words. You don't want your art your paper to be 100% quotes from articles. So type in your own thoughts. And many students do use the outline that I'm giving you in this rubric. They use it as their outline for the paper. I'm not sure it's the best organi organization. Um, I would recommend that you actually write your paper as your first draft. I think a good approach is to actually use the rubric. And then as you look at it and you see how things fit together better, you might move things around so that it makes more logical sense how it flows given what you're going to recommend. But to at least, if your first draft is in the order of the rubric, you make sure you've covered everything in the rubric because it's a very extensive rubric. So let's start looking at this rubric. <clears throat> and it's in three pieces, and that's what I recommend for your paper. You have an introduction to the issue. You're then going to go into detail in the problem of healthcare and health insurance. Again, it says health insurance, but it's healthcare and health insurance. And you want to go through possible solutions. <clears throat> so that's your paper. And so when we look at the introduction, the first thing most people start off with their paper is talking about how health insurance and health care is a special issue in the United States. You can look at it as an expenditure versus our economy. You can look at it at the cost per person. There's so many different ways. And these articles will tell you some of the articles are a little older than others and you could probably get a more current number than what's in the articles and you're perfectly uh, you, you know you're welcome to do more more current research you could even type how large is healthcare as a percentage of the US economy and I'm sure some articles would come up <clears throat> but you're also welcome to use the numbers and the articles even though some of them may be a couple years old uh, this this will not be addressed probably in the first two articles, but you'll see a few articles where they'll definitely give this number. It may change every time just because it's a different year, but we'll definitely get numbers there. This next one, the first article covers this. We covered it in class as well. But what happens when insurance, remember insurance is designed to cover low frequency events, those things that don't happen very often, that keeps the insurance costs down. Obviously, you want it to be high severity, but what happens when insurance covers both high frequency and low frequency? So that's what the HFLF means. What happens when insurance covers both of these? Life insurance, auto insurance, uh, disability insurance, all insurance that we know of is focused on low frequency events. Your auto insurance does not cover oil changes. 
health insurance is the one exception. So we'll get into that issue. Some argue because health insurance is different that you want to try to catch things early, but we'll get into that debate. And then a big part of the introduction is a discussion on who are the players and what are their incentives. And we'll hit that throughout. The first article definitely hits that. In fact, the first article does a really good job of laying out who are the players and a pretty high level discussion of the incentives. So you can really flesh that out, that one out with the first, the first uh, article. And we'll talk about, you know, obviously you have the patient or the insured, you have the hospitals and doctors, you have the insurance companies, you have employers who provide insurance, you have the government. So those are the five groups that are generally talked about under players and incentives. Then you're gonna get into the problems and so there's a bunch of them. So we'll go through them. At the very first, it's issues about technology. Why does technology make healthcare more expensive? Where everywhere else we use technology, it makes things less expensive. So we have to talk about that distortion. Then we'll talk about health, health insurance being tied to employment and what that means for tax treatment. We've already talked about the insurance model, but we'll talk a little bit about that, how inefficient it is. We'll spend quite a bit of time talking about the bad job healthcare does in many areas. Low quality healthcare, medical malpractice, a lot of fraud and waste. There's one, one book in particular we'll look at, not today, but we'll look at related to Medicare and that as much as 30% to even over 50% of Medicare is fraud and waste. So some pretty amazing numbers. A lot of regulation, bureaucracy that makes costs higher and then we'll spend a lot of time on these two right here. We have an industry that's focused more on treatment than on prevention. Doctors prefer to do surgery than tell people to eat right and, and exercise and not do dangerous things. And then you'll notice over diagnosis, over treatment, I, I give twice as much weight there. We'll spend quite a bit of time talking about over diagnosis. There's a, um, a video I want you to watch. Um, and I'll, I'll use it as part of the class time. So it, 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 you know, I forget how long it is. It might be about, about uh, not quite as long as a class, but um, so I might have one class, a, a full 75 minutes and another class. I let you skip it if you watch the video. Um, but that one, that one will be eye opening to you. It is a few years old, but every time I watch it, it's, there's really nothing that out of date about it. Maybe a few of the numbers are, a few years old, but the, the relative size of everything is about the same. We'll talk about Americans and why Americans have special lifestyle issues. Um, the system itself, how complex it is and how much we don't know about how much things cost. Quality again and how inconsistent cost and quality are city to city. And that inefficiency is actually encouraged. So we'll see some of these are overlapping. Um, and so, you know, you, you may not be sure exactly where to put it, um, but think through the issue as we get into it, and I'll try to tie you back to it. We'll talk about supply creating its own demand because doctors have more information than the patient. We'll talk about the government's role in this, and we'll see some articles on that. In fact, the second article we do today, he's going to directly criticize the government for this particular thing, that the government tends to control prices when what we need are controls on cost. What happens when you control prices rather than control costs? And he actually gives an example of the uh, just really misaligned incentives. Um, there's some, some specific issues you'll see in a couple of articles talking about fewer people are becoming primary care doctors. Everybody wants to be a specialist because that's where the money is. And yet primary care doctors can really help save money in the system by keeping people from going to the most expensive option and helping them find less expensive options. And then the very last few are, are special related to uh, issues that are, are definitely just true around the entire world. But how do you handle pre-existing conditions? We'll talk about that. What do you do with the baby boomers? So again, the baby boomers come up as an issue just like it did in paper one. And then we will talk some about end of life care in particular. Um, a lot of people, 70, 80, 90 percent of their health care costs happen in the last six months of their life. That we're not extending life or just uh, prolonging the dying process and people are sitting in hospitals and and you'll notice that in in the video i want to want you to watch where a, a a man is keeping his his very aged and 
and comatose mom alive on ventilators. There's no brain activity. The doctors had told him she's, she's dead. She, there's nothing there. She has no chance of recovery. And he says, I want you to do everything you can to keep her alive and spending millions of dollars in it. And then a few months later, she passes away anyway. And all those millions of dollars. We'll talk about that. It's a touchy issue. And then obviously in the U.S., a big issue with uninsured Americans. Um, and we'll have to talk that. Obviously, the Affordable Care Act has reduced that number quite significantly, but there's still quite a few Americans by choice. Actually, if you look at the numbers, there are many Americans that by choice are uninsured, not because they can't afford insurance, although most of them um, insurance would be an, ex an expensive proposition, so it would definitely set them back, but they could do it. They just choose not to. So those are the problem issues you'll see. We'll walk through each one of these. You can certainly add others, but I would definitely try to hit 90 if not 100 percent of these. Then on solutions, we'll come back. Some of these solutions are tied back to what we said on the problems. So insurance is tied to the employer. One of the solutions you'll, you'll see is why do we provide health insurance through the employer? We don't apply supply auto insurance or homeowners insurance to the employer. We do provide some life insurance, but it's just a minor amount. Um, we do provide disability, but you know, why, why health insurance? And health insurance is a huge one. Why do we provide that through the employer? Why don't we just let em employees buy insurance for themselves like they do everything else and the employer just pays them? We'll talk about that and that comes back to the tax code. And then we'll come back to the purpose of insurance and we'll talk about medical savings accounts and health savings accounts and moving insurance just to be for high severity, low frequency events. We'll talk about high, how technology can be used to reduce costs. We'll talk about quality initiatives, hospital checklists, way we can actually reduce costs and improve the quality of healthcare. We'll talk about what Safeway has been doing. Uh, process improvements. We'll talk some about that. You'll see some pretty amazing things. Uh, doctors' offices are incredibly inefficient, waste a lot of money because they're not really focused on on efficiency. Um, it's not part of their model. So, can we bring some business process improvements? We talk about end of life care, other models, medical tourism, lower cost models. We'll talk about some of that nurse practitioners. I'll give you some examples from my own life and some of you probably have some examples. Um, and and we'll, I think we sh we'll probably have a Zoom session on this uh, so that you can get feedback and discuss. I might get, as I mentioned, might get the outside speaker to come talk to us. What about the mandatory coverage that you see in the Affordable Care Act? What about a single payer system? Medicare for all, would that be a solution? Some of you might want to argue for that and you could certainly go to uh, Bernie Sanders webpage or just just do Medicare for all and all kinds of articles would come up and as long as when you argue for it when you look at the articles you go back and address the issues we talked about uh, including the incredible high cost of Medicare that you address those in your answer that's that's fine that you know you can you might change my opinion on Medicare for all uh, we will talk some a few past this one might need to be under problems instead of under solutions but somehow you have to address the issue that health insurance and health care is more expensive for men, for women than for men. And I'll show you uh, an article on that. And then there's an important article at the end. Um, we might spend an entire class. Michael Porter, you probably have heard of him. He does Porter's Five Forces. I cover that in a couple of my classes. Um, hopefully you've seen that. If not, you might want to read up on it before you interview because it's pretty Pretty important stuff. You do you do see a lot of Michael Porter five forces, but surprisingly, he's also a a major driver in the healthcare reform, and he has an idea idea called outcomes based medicine, and that's where the speaker I'm interested in getting for us. Um, that's he's a consultant and he's done a lot of analysis on outcome based medicine, and then other. And I might add something. If we get the outside speaker, I'll add a line that you need to talk some of what you got from the outside speaker. Um, so we'll just see. The outside speaker might say no just because we're recording in classes, or maybe we'll do the outside speaker, but I won't record that part of the class or something. We'll see. I don't. I don't know yet. Um, I, I might also try to get some some actual doctors to come talk to us for a little bit, but we'll see. Um, it's it's tough because our class is so late at night. 
But all right, so have this in front of you, know where they are, and I'll try to help you as we go to put those put these articles in the right place. So let's start with this first guy, Lawrence Merrill. Uh, Lawrence Merrill, he was the commissioner of insurance for the District of Columbia. So you start thinking District of Columbia, and that's a very liberal city, very left-leaning city, but Lawrence Merrill was appointed by a Republican. Um, he is extremely libertarian, very, very far right. So I'm, I'm the first two articles, I'm giving you someone far from the right, and the second article, someone from far to the left. I just want you to see that a lot of what they're saying is very, very similar. It's, it's not all that radically different. But the first thing he starts off with is the problem with, with, with insurance and way it works for health insurance. You can tell it from the title of his article. We call it insurance, but that's not healthy. So he does exactly what we did in class, talk about an insurable event. It's something that's unlikely to happen. Again, that's low frequency, comes without warning. Again, low frequency and accidental. It's not something we want to have happen. And it's not something the person wants to have happen. So uh, it's unlikely to happen. It comes without warning. It's not something we planned and it's not something we want to have happen to us. Um, that covers things like serious illness, cancer, um, uh, broken leg. Those that's what it, that's what it applies to. It does not apply to re routine health maintenance, and it also may not apply to pregnancy. We'll talk about maternity and some of the issues there. Um, you know, maternity obviously, obviously often comes with warning. A lot of people, you know, plan their family and know they want to have children, and they plan it, and they know. Um, you know, have a pretty good idea of when it's going to happen and all that. So, uh, so you already see right there, health insurance covers things like routine health maintenance. Well, that's very likely to happen. It's not very unlikely. It's very likely to happen. Comes without warning. Well, maternity definitely comes with warning. And it's not something the insured wants to happen. Well, you know, routine health maintenance or maternity, those are things that we generally don't mind. It's not something we dread. Uh, you, I mean, you might dread your doctor visits, but it's not a horrible, horrible thing. Um, so can insurance cover both of these? That gets back to that introduction, define in, an insurable event, and then address it with health insurance. Mm -hmm. So health insurance tries to cover both catastrophic insurance and regular health care in one system. And he says that's impossible. It's a built-in contradiction. We'll be seeing this more. But all of this is introductory type of the things that to define what an insurable event is. How should we be using insurance? And then set that up to say the current system uh, doesn't follow those rules like other insurance does. So insurance works best when the fewest people use it. Healthcare works best when the most people use it. So he's saying the two goals are incompatible. Healthcare is a business. It wants a lot of volume. Insurance is a business, it wants very little volume because it's, it's, a, it's hedging people's risk. And you're trying to cover, cover those two things all in one system. Then he talks about managed care. You don't really need to talk managed care in this paper unless you just want to. It, managed care might be your solution. We'll talk a little bit about, there, there are a few people who think managed care is the solution if we fix it. We go back to the way it used to be where it was real draconian and wouldn't let people see specialists, and you'd have to go to your primary care physician first. This, Merrill does not like that solution. It says it satisfies nobody. It infuriates the hospitals and doctors. It infuriates consumers because of limits and demand on payment. Are saying that treatment's not nece medically necessary. Legislators, uh, they get frustrated, and so they try to fix it. We'll talk about this idea that politicians love, which is mandating payment for services. Um, is that a good solution? Do you want our government mandating that we have to do certain things? Um, and so is, there's a very negative downside to that approach. Uh, so whether something's necessary or not, I mean, I'll just tell you already in the Affordable Care Act, it was an interesting debate. The outcome-based medicine was, was part of the law. Uh, I can't remember the exact number, but somewhere around a billion dollars was in the law to study outcome-based. So if two treatments had the same outcomes, but one cost $20,000 and the other one cost 2000 
um, that the Affordable Care Act would say, hey, if one costs 20000 one costs 2000 and research has shown they have the exact same outcome, then you have to use the 2000 if you're going to be covered by an Affordable Care Act plan. The Republicans did not like that. They started talk talking about things like death panels. You got these remote doctors and scientists and economists saying this is covered, this is not covered. And they call it, you know, we're going we're gonna to kill your grand, grandmother because we're not allowing her to get the treatment that she needs. And so what the Affordable Care Act did is it left a billion dollars in there for study of outcome-based medicines, but the law was changed to make it illegal for them to use that data in any way to control costs. Uh, I, I definitely disagree with that. Uh, you'll see, we'll, we'll talk some about the UK system. There's one of our first articles uh, in the next group of articles will be about the UK and how they're different and boy they're very strict on what is covered and what is not covered and there's been some major news stories in the UK where they refuse to cover where if that happened in the United States it would have been uh, people rioting and protesting but in the UK they've just gotten used to their health system telling them no you cannot do this this is not allowed so so mandated benefit benefits uh, what is covered, what's not covered, that's a big issue in the U.S. So what our government does is says, hey, we're just going to force them to cover everything, and obviously that's going to make costs uh, skyrocket. <laughs> Healthcare services are negotiated. Here's We talk about the parties. Healthcare services are negotiated not by the affected parties, not by physicians, hospitals, consumers, but healthcare services are negotiated between insurance companies and employers. So the people providing the service, the people receiving the service, they're, they're third parties. They're outside of the loop of the actual negotiation. It's the insurers and the employers. Now what about employers? What can we say about that? Well, the employers are trying to find the least expensive plan. Their goal is not to provide, your employer's goal is not to provide you the greatest health insurance plan possible. Their goal is to find one that is good enough so that you'll still work for them, but then as cheap as possible once they find that. So if A, B, and C are, for your standpoint, is any one of those is fine with you, you'll go work for the company, they're going to pick the one that is the cheapest for them. Um, so they have no incentive to overwhelm you with the greatest health insurance plan possible. Um, so... <clears throat> Insurance companies try to keep costs down by paying providers less. We'll talk some about that. That incentive may be going away given what's happened with the Affordable Care Act. Um, that hurts doctors and hospitals. You have heard of some doctors and hospitals refusing to accept Medicare payments anymore because of some of the cuts from Medicare. Um, so, you know, it's it's a plan that doesn't make sense because it's we, we, are, we are a competitive economy, a free free market economy, but with healthcare, all of the incentives are messed up. Now, you're saying, well, that's Merrill. He's a libertarian, so obviously he, he believes that. Wait till we get to the second argue, article when we have a, a, a strong left-leaning Democrat, but you'll be surprised he's going to say the same thing. Uh, pretty amazing that um, having this insurance mechanism in between the consumer and the providers of service really distorts um, the economics behind health insurance and health care. So what is the answer? Now you can see he does not like Medicare for all. A universal government provided health care plan, he says, I don't think so. I don't think government can solve these issues any better than private insurers can. Uh, so he doesn't like it. The second article I'm going to show you, he likes government provided health care for the major, major items, the 100,000 plus cost items. So if something costs over hundred thousand dollars then he says then the government will have a plan for catastrophic coverage. I've thought about that. It's it's intriguing. Um, it would be interesting if if we made Medicare for all but only for catastrophic care and then we use health savings accounts and and health care for anything smaller amounts than that. Um, but it, it's an interesting notion. I'm not sure with the baby boomers retiring and their health care needs really skyrocketing in the next 30, 40 years. Uh, even, even that's going to be a solution, but we'll see. It's, it, there's, there's some huge issues with all of this. <clears throat> so <clears throat> what is his solution? So here's the first solution. So we talked about the problem. You can notice he did not talk much about the problems other than he talked 
some about the who are the players and what are their incentives and how can we change that around. He was more what is insurance, how should insurance work, and so his solution gets back to that. He wants a two-tier system. So healthcare needs um, covered by two different systems. One is catastrophic illness, and that's what insurance is the answer for. Now he he says high deductibles, five hundred thousand dollars. I mean five thousand dollars a year with relatively these are relatively inexpensive plans, and I actually priced some of those myself and found some for myself that were less than a thousand dollars. So you get a really high deductible plan. If you're really healthy, you think it's highly unlikely you'll need insurance, then yeah, high, high deductible plan. Uh, that's what I was talking about with me with USAA and they paid me a thousand dollars to get rid of their insurance and I, you know, so, um, but up to that point I was using a high deductible plan and uh, saving me so much money I just socked it away and I saved up much more than the deduction. deduction. Uh, with high upper limits, I'm not sure a million dollar limit is enough, but you know, if you want to keep costs down, then you have to put these upper limits on. Uh, managed care doesn't have upper limits, so that may be part of what's driving their costs. <laughs> um, most people will never need this then. Now you're going to see in the second article, he also recommends high deductible plans. His high deductible is more in the neighborhood of tens of thousands of dollars, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. So man, it's it's... So a similar solution for him. But his argument is we if we focus insurance just on those low frequency, high severity events, the cost will be very low because very few people will use it. Uh, and you know, those chronic illness, um, insurance would still cover those. Um, so you know, even people who have ongoing illnesses like diabetes or heart disease. They'll still be covered, but they'll have to cover five thousand a year out of their own pocket, and that's an incentive. We'll talk about incentives for Americans that keep themselves healthy. Um, will high deductibles do that? We'll get into that. What about the normal health care routine medical coverage? He says insurance is not the answer there. One thing he says is just pay for it out of pocket. That's what the second article is going to say to do um, with certain costs for routine. Now he is the second article is going to say routine medical procedures should be free provided by the government. I'm, I'm, I'll tell you why I disagree with the second article on that. But this first article he says you should pay for these out of pocket just like we pay for everything else. Or you could use a medical savings account. So maybe the tax code gives you some break. You set aside a you know, if you have a $5,000 deductible, then the government allows you to set aside $5,000 in a medical savings account. You can fund it with pre-tax dollars. Maybe your employer even helps you fund it. Um, and we'll talk about this. I'm going to show you the numbers. If your employer is not providing you all of the health insurance, they'll most likely give most of that money they were spending on health insurance, and they'll probably just give it to you part of your paycheck. I know that was true in the employees employers I've worked for. They looked at employer employees as total compensation. So if they're spending $15,000 a year for health insurance and they can cut that cost to $5,000, they'll probably give most, if not all of that $10,000 in savings, give it as a salary to their employees. And we'll, we'll look at those numbers and see how that works. And then a third option uh, would be for the very poor people, uh, the working poor, the people without employment, those that are uh, you know, just homeless or whatever, the government would have a membership prepaid health plan for them because even routine health care could be out of out of whack for them. Um, and why why should we do this when he argues it? Well, essentially, and I talked about this a little earlier, this is what a lot of large employers have started doing. High deductible plans with health savings accounts, um, so there's the first article. You can see a lot of introductory information there, especially related to what's an insurable event. So here his, his main focus is on his solution, and we'll talk about his solution. Um, he still has an employer-based system, uh, <clears throat> but only for the catastrophic care. So we'll see some that have their solution is this completely untie health insurance to the employer. <clears throat> You're going to see that recommendation coming both from the far right and from the far left. In fact, there are several 
Um, in fact, I was reading the book by the, the man who was the main consultant behind, behind President Obama's um, Affordable Care Act. And reading his book, uh, it was an interesting book. Uh, he made a lot of the points we're going to make in this class. But he comes right out and says, you know, if the Affordable Care Act works well, we won't have employer-provided health insurance um, five, ten years from now. So, so far that hasn't happened. I know Kamala Harris got into some problems during her campaign saying she wanted to eliminate employer-provided. But you can see the solutions are, are all over the place. So you, you need to look at the problems, think about them carefully, and then think about how does the solution directly tie to that, to that problem. All right, so the second article is an intriguing kind of provocative title, How American Healthcare Killed My Father. This is by Goldhild. He is a journalist. Um, the first guy, first article was more of an economist type. Goldhild is a journalist who studies healthcare. Um, so he's not necessarily an expert. We'll be seeing some articles written by experts such as Michael Porter and, and also the uh, one book I'm going to show you was extremely well researched. But um, he wrote an article, um, I think in the New York Times. I'm not sure exactly where this is, um, but I think this was in the New York Times. And then he converted this into a book. So I'm going to quote his article. We're just going to focus on the parts that are highlighted. You're more than welcome to read the entire article. But um, I'm just going to focus for our purposes on the uh, highlighted parts. <clears throat> and so I'll tell you where this falls into the, the rubric. So hit the first thing he talks about is related to his father. His father died because his father picked up an infection while he was in the hospital. And we're going to talk about how that's, a, I think it's the third leading cause of death in the United States hospital mistakes, people picking up infections. And so he starts off with that because he's somewhat frustrated that his father had to die at all. Um, and so he brings up one of the things I have in the solutions are the Pronovos checklist. Um, and I've seen this on TV shows. I know Grey's Anatomy. I used to watch that a little bit. And there was one, one, uh, one of the episodes where one of the doctors, her job was to actually implement the pro pronovost or some checklist in their hospital and they showed uh, how she was just getting beat up by the other doctors they just didn't want her you know how, don't tell me how to do my job uh, but by the very, very end she convinced them that what she was doing <laughs> made a lot of sense so this is one of the solutions is implementing these checklists um, any, the hospitals that have implemented these have seen instantaneous success reducing infection rates by enormous amounts, two thirds within three months. And some of the articles we'll see later on, it's, there's even more impressive. And some of them pretty scary. You're gonna see one article, uh, I think this is in the class notes about um, how, few doc how few surgeons actually wash their hands before surgery. Um, but many physicians reject the checklist. It's unnecessary, unnecessary belittling. Um, Many hospital executives are reluctant to push that on them. So I'll, I'll quote again. I might have said this earlier, but I, I'll just quote it again. Um, a CFO of, of a hospital was asked about something similar to this, maybe not exactly the provenance, but, but a, a process that greatly reduced error rates. So fewer of their patients would have to come back because of an infection or because a sponge was accidentally left in their body during a surgery or they amputated the wrong leg. I mean, it's amazing the things that hospitals do as a mistake. Um, and the CFO's answer was, why would I want to do that? When we fix our mistakes, that's a big part of our revenue. That gets back to that term incentives. And uh, one thing you'll see on the rubric is inefficiencies are encouraged. If a doctor if a hospital does not have good, good hygiene, doesn't follow good quality standards, and as a result, their patients pick up uh, uh, viruses or bacteria, and so they have to come back in, and the doctors now have to treat them for the infection, and then they make another ten, twenty thousand dollars treating the infection. Wow, you know, they have no incentive. Any efficiency is encouraged. It's it's good for the hospital. And that's what that's, I was surprised to see if I would say that. The article I saw that in, it's not one of our articles. I wish I had kept it because it was pretty amazing. 
But uh, he did not identify himself or what hospital he was at, but it was pretty eye-opening, pretty shocking. Um, so why are we so sloppy here? You know, you see the stories about uh, Chipotle and um, Jack in the Box. You saw uh, with um, Bluebell Ice Cream, these places who have had, you know, uh, fairly minor issues with, with, their, with food poisoning. And boy, they shut down the entire company and Chipotle was greatly harmed but Chipotle hasn't killed nearly as many people as hospitals kill all the day all the time unnecessarily obviously people die in hospitals and it wasn't the fault of the hospital but there are hundreds of thousands of deaths happening uh, because um, because of poor quality um, preventable hospital deaths in US, U.S. may nearly may kill nearly 200,000 patients per year. Why do we accept that? Why hasn't the government, govern, government, federal government, and we'll talk about why doesn't the federal government do more? Because Medicare gives them a huge, huge hammer that they can they can hammer into this issue. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that, about that. We'll see some articles on that. Next thing he starts asking, so here we're in the problem side of this article. So who are the villains? Trying to find someone to blame. Uh, um, but trying to do that is just distracted of us. All the actors in healthcare, uh, they work in a heavily regulated, so there's one of the problems, heavily regulated, massively subsidized interest, industry full of structural distortion. That's a great sentence right there. So he's saying everybody wants to do well. I have, I have doctors in my graduate class. They're very impressive people. I'm very impressed not just in their intelligence. They're always my best students in those classes. We have a relationship with the, the um, UTSA Health Science Center that let their, let their uh, workers come and take our graduate course. I'm very impressive, but also just listening to them how how passionate they are about serving their their patients well so uh, these there's not evil people trying to milk the system we're going to definitely see some evil people including doctors there are some bad players in here but the overall system is is not an issue of just have evil people so here's a here's a key sentence right here they are all they they also all behave rationally in response to economic incentives there's that word incentives so key to this whole paper they respond to incentives that those distortions create. So we have to understand what are those bad dis distortions. Uh, we're definitely going to see our bad incentives. Uh, we're definitely going to see that when we talk about um, overdiagnosis. In the video I want you to watch, you'll see uh, several examples of overdiagnosis, whether it's prostate cancer, breast cancer, uh, C-sections for women uh, that are pregnant, uh, where, where the system has a tendency to err toward what makes them the most money, even though the data says they shouldn't do that. So there is, you know, even though the doctor may be thinking they're doing what's in the best interest, it also happens to be in the doctor's best interest, not just in the patient's best interest, and sometimes not in the patient's best interest. So per perverse, terrible perverse results, incentives that emphasize health care over any other aspect of well-being, that's a good, that's, Part of what we said, treatment versus wellness, or treatment versus prevention. We emphasize treatment on prevention. So you'll see that under the problem section. It's one of the rubric items, treatment versus prevention. This is a good place to come and quote for that section. It disguises true costs. We're going to talk about that, how non-transparent costs are in hospitals. They favor complexities, discourage transparent competition. Um, based on price, art, quality, the result, uh, they result in a generational pyramid scheme rather than sustainable financing. Most important, remove consumers from our irreplaceable role in the ultimate insurer, insurer of value. We'll get into that more, especially when we talk about Michael Porter and his solution, how to address that, how do we figure out what the true costs are, and how do we make decisions so that it's maximizing value to the consumer of health insurance, of health care, the patient. Um, maybe the best answer for the patient is not surgery. Maybe the best thing we can do with the patient is, is put them, pay for their health 
their health club membership. But health insurance doesn't pay for, for health for gyms. But maybe it should. Maybe we should spend some of that money we're spending on health care and fix the water system in Flint, Michigan. So these are the kind of things he's talking about. We're spending so much on health care and spending so much on health insurance that we may actually be harming health and harming well-being. So that's that's an important concept. That's This is all part of that focus of treatment over prevention and over wellness. Um, so here he's going to address the Affordable Care Act. He wrote this before Affordable Care Act, but he you can tell he's not a big fan of the Affordable Care Act where he's talking about a comprehensive reform. Um, he says the Affordable Care Act you know, I'm putting words into his mind, m mouth, but it's definitely he's referring to something very similar to Affordable Care Act. He says it merely cements in place the current system. Insurance-based, that's definitely Affordable Care Act. Employment-centered, now Affordable Care Act may actually be the opposite of that over time. It certainly provides insurance to people who aren't employed. And there are a few employers who have thought about stopping providing in health insurance to their employees and let them just go to the Affordable Care Out Act uh, healthcare.gov and get their, their get their health insurance themselves. It's very complex. It addresses it, it addresses the underlying causes of a crisis crisis only obliquely, if at all, by extending the current system to more people, it will likely increase the ultimate cost. Um, I've I've read some things in, in, about President Obama and, and the Affordable Care Act, and. I get the sense he really wanted to address both the demand and the supply side of healthcare. He really wanted to address both. I think he fully understood there was a serious supply issue. We were consuming way too much health insurance, health care, and health insurance, and we needed to fix those incentives. But he finally had to face reality: the healthcare system donates more money to our politicians than any other. Uh, industry out there, our politicians are very beholden in order for them to pay these ex pay for these extremely expensive um, political campaigns. So he threw in the tire out towel. They, they did a few things. We might talk a little bit about Affordable Care Act. They did a few things to try to address the supply side. So far, it's been a mix, mixed bag, and I think a lot of them have just gone by the wayside. But he definitely fixed the demand side. There's more people in, went into the system. Even states that initially fought the, expand, the expansion of Medicare and Medicaid, um, many of those states have come around, like Kansas, and have, are now saying they want to expand Medicare for their state. I don't know if Texas has ever come around on that. Um, but essentially what we're doing is we're moving hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, into a very broken system. Um, and so, you know, I, I have the same opinion on college education. I think college education has a supply problem. We need to really work on the quality of the product. And so when people are talking about free college for all and we put more students in the system, I say, well, wait a minute, why don't we fix the system first before we pour more customers into it? And so that's his complaint and I, I can definitely see that. Uh, so he says it's largely a, pro largely a problem of incentives. So until we change the incentives, uh, whatever our reforms do is just going to do more harm than good. And really, Congress, every time they do a major health care reform, they do nothing more than send more money to the health care system. Uh, so it needs to become uh, subject to the same forces that make the rest of the economy efficient. So as I told you, this guy is a Democrat. He's a fairly far left-leaning Democrat. But right now he sounds more like a libertarian. We need to reduce rather than expand the role of insurance. We're going to talk about that. That gets back to the first article, right? Insurance should only cover low-frequency, high-severity events. He's saying exactly the same thing. Governments should focus its role on protecting the poor and protecting against true catastrophes, you know, safety and competition. Um, we need to get away from the Posse scheme financing. He's talking about Medicare there. Hidden subsidies, manipulated prices. The hidden sub subsidies, this is something we'll talk some about that you in, in the class should be really concerned about. Why does the Affordable Care Act, why are they so desperate to get healthy young people into the system? And the reason they argue that is we need young people in to pay premiums so we can afford 
to cover these sick older people. Well, as soon as someone says that, they're already admitting that they're ripping you off as young people. Remember in auto, in auto insurance, as a young person, young people are more dangerous drivers, so you have to pay your fair share. You have to pay a lot more for auto insurance because you are young. I mean, it'd be nice if we could force older people to have to pay more for auto insurance so we could subsidize young drivers and they don't have to pay as much. But that's not how the system works. Young drivers have to pay a lot for auto insurance because they are young. But now the government says, hey, we want young people in the system and we want to intentionally overcharge them. And we'll look at those numbers, how much you're being intentionally overcharged for health insurance so that we can generate extra money to pay for those older sicker uh, people in the United States. That's not insurance. Uh, that's like a forced financing plan where you're you're being forced to subsidize someone else. And the people you're being forced to subsidize, many of them are very wealthy people. Uh, senior citizens in the United States, there are definitely poor senior citizens, but as a group, senior, senior citizens are much wealthier than our 20 year olds in this country. And yet this, this healthcare system is forcing young people to subsidize older people. Um, manipulated prices, undisclosed results. Uh, so we'll talk about this outcome-based medicine and evidence-based medicine and what, what kind of impact that could have on fixing the problems. We need to rely more on ourselves as the consumer, um, looking for service, price, and, and trade-offs. There may be times where you say, you know what, I'm not, I'm not going to seek that treatment. Um, it might keep me alive for two more weeks, but I'll be in the hospital with everything hooked up to me. I just want to go into hospice. I want to, I want to um, stay home as long as I can with my family next to me, and then I want to go into hospice in a place my family can come visit me. I don't want to be hooked up to a machine in a hospital with my, my friends and family can only come in small numbers. So we'll talk about you know, giving us the ability to make those kind of decisions. Um, so before spending another one trillion dollars, we need to understand the causes we all experience. So he's going to go into the causes a little bit here, um, but he's going to get into this issue of are there better places for us to spend our money than on surgeries and and heart treatments and prostate cancer treatments and um, mammograms? Are there better places we can spend our money? We'll talk about each one of those and why the evidence shows we're overspending on those things. But he said, could we spend money on education, on public safety, on the environment, on infrastructure? Um, why does society determine an extra $100 billion for health care will make us healthier than $10 billion on clean air or water? There I get back to the Flint, Michigan. Our $25 billion on better nutrition, $5 billion on parks, or $10 billion on recreation. Um, you know, we're, more and more people are riding bikes. Can we make San Antonio a better bike city so it's easier to get around? I ride my bike everywhere, but it's not a, a particularly bike-friendly city. Uh, more vacation time. You know, all these things that may actually be better for our health, both our physical health and our mental health, than what we're spending on health care. Um, so he used an example of that housing market and how our government subsidizes people who borrow money to buy houses and talks about you know that you know you can go back to 2008 and how that helped contribute to the housing crisis he wrote this article I think um, um, not right in the middle of that but you know definitely thinking about how our government pushes people to buy houses why well, should our government do that maybe renting is the better solution and maybe people should be making the decision right now you don't have that choice you, you go to an employer whatever health plan they provide that's what you buy they're subsidizing it, so you might as well take it. You're, you're, you're somewhat taken out of the loop rather than your employer saying, hey, I'm spending $15,000 on this. Would you rather just have the $15,000 yourself? And maybe you can spend $5,000 on health care that has a really high deductible, and you have $10,000 you can do on other things. You can spend some of it going to the gym. You can spend some of it spending a little bit more money on groceries to buy a healthier, healthier diet, those kind of things. That's, that's what he's after. It's that economic decision of how do we best allocate the resources and let the people whose health is being managed, let them make the decision and not employers and insurance companies and healthcare providers. Um, so 
we're seeing distorted demand, rising, raising prices, making us all poor by crowding out more beneficial uses of that money. And he'll he'll give a specific number later. You'll see his actual number. Uh, it's it's I think 170 or 1.7 million or something. I can't remember the exact number, but over our lifetime, how much we spend on health care and health insurance, and think if we just cut that in half and spent that money on other things, wouldn't we be better off as Americans? <laughs> All right, here's here's an issue. Um, it was hinted at in the first article. He blatantly says it in this article. Uh, politicians will say Americans have no health care when what they really mean is they're Americans who do not have health insurance. If an American does not have health insurance, they can still go to the doctor. They have to be treated. Doctors have to accept them. We don't let people die in the street because they don't have health insurance. Um, they may have to wait a long time or it may not be the greatest quality care, but they do have access to health care, but they may not have access to health insurance. And so he's asking the question, why do we make those two things the exact same thing? So, And I've heard that a lot. And you've even noticed me. I keep switching between health insurance and health care. Um, I, I mix the two up. I try to correct myself when I really mean health care versus health insurance. And the first article says those two things are really opposites. One wants low volume in health insurance and one wants high volume in health care. Uh, but you will see, you will hear uh, politicians often say we have Americans that have no access to health care. And that's just absolutely not true. They just don't have health insurance. Um, health insurance is a primary payment mechanism, um, but it's not covering just high high severity, low frequency events, it's covering everything. We become so used to health insurance covering everything that we're, we're incensed if we have to pay anything out of pocket. Um, we don't do that with gasoline. You know, we don't cover gasoline with our auto insurance policy. We don't cover our electric bills with our homeowners policy, but for some reason with health care, everything should be covered. We don't want to pay anything other than a really small, you know, Thirty dollars, thirty-five dollars. Uh, we want everything coming, everything else coming out of that. Regular checkups, dental cleanings, everything should be covered by insurance. Uh, pregnancies are planned. Now he's going to actually argue that people should should cover their own pregnancies out of their own pocket. I don't. I'm not going to make that argument. I don't want my tires slashed. That's a very touchy issue. Um, so uh, you know, I, I know I'm subsidizing people who have children. And you know that's my contribution because I benefit from people having children because it provides people who are going to be alive and take care of me when I'm in the nursing home my old age. So you know there's a lot of economic, social issues here that you can certainly jump into, but um, he's pretty radical. It's kind of shocking given his political background. Um, so comprehensive health insurance is so ingrained that we forget um, that it's pretty recent. It's really rose up during the World War, World War II. Um, so why is it there? So here's part of the problem. And when you look in the problems, one of the first problems listed, it's, it's two things combined. It's the fact that health insurance is tied to our employment. So why is it tied to our employment? It's tied to our employment because of its tax benefit. So back during World War II, we had, there were... Um, limits on how much people could be paid. So caps on, on payrolls. And, but employers still needed to hire the best people they could hire. So what employers started doing is saying, well, we can't pay you more money. We can only pay you, say, $5,000 a year, which is a great salary back then. However, we can give you health care. And the government allowed that. So you can't pay your employee more than $5,000, but you can give them all the health care you want to give them. And so now the question is, how will that be taxed? And for some reason, for some reason, the IRS decided that the employer could take a tax deduction and the employee could receive that benefit tax-free. It is the most advantageous tax benefit in the U.S. tax code, and it's also the largest subsidy there is. And it's also a subsidy that helps the wealthy more than it helps the poor. It's definitely skewed toward the wealthiest and best paid employees in the United States. Um, so that's why it happened. And this is my argument. Some of you might want to do some research of how different that is. I haven't done it, but I do think the U.S. is very unique in allowing this incredible tax benefit 
uh, in its tax code. Uh, so it'd be interesting to research to see if other countries, a lot of other countries like Canada and UK have a government provided plan, so it's very, very different. Um, but for those countries where most of the insurance comes from the employer, how many of them have a tax strategy uh, set up tax wise the way the US is? Uh, and I really do think this is a major reason the US spending on healthcare is so much higher than other countries. This system, this tax benefit, really encourages the overconsumption of healthcare. But we'll talk about that. And what we could what could we replace this with? What if we did not allow health insurance provided by the employer to have such an incredible beneficial tax treatment? Um, and then Medicare and Medicaid, they just followed that same plan and made it comprehensive. And so we've seen huge inflation in insurance and healthcare because of that. <clears throat> so funding everything. So that's part of his problem. Um, that's, that's part of the introduction. In the introduction, you're saying insurance to cover low frequency, high severity, and that's what he's addressing here. So in this article, page five of this, pages four and five of this article, you can get some extra things to help that introduction to your paper in, along with what we saw in, in article one. Um, insurance is complex, costly, distortional me method for financing any activity. So one of the problems you'll notice in the rubric is the inefficiency of the insurance model. We talked about that. Insurance hires actuaries, underwriters. It's an extremely expensive business. So you really want to limit it to those low frequency events uh, so that you don't have to use it all that often. When you use insurance a lot, that's when its high expenses become really a problem and it really raises costs uh, of everything. We'll, we'll look at that. Uh, it's you know, Just think about it. The Affordable Care Act has loss ratio requirements of say uh, 80%. Well just think about that. It means when you spend a hundred dollars um, for health care, 25% of that is just covering the insurance. Because insurance companies they take a hundred dollars in premiums. Eighty dollars of it is to pay claims and pay doctors and hospitals. $20 of it is to pay their expenses and their profit. So that, you know, 20 divided by 80 is 25%. So every time we use health insurance, we're raising the cost of health care by 25%. It's distortive. So we want to limit that as much as possible. Uh, he gives the example of the grocery bill. We talked about that earlier in class as well. He says in 2006, so again, these are really old numbers. Sorry about that, um, but I really like this article. It costs $500 per person just to do the insurance piece. Just the insurance piece. Nothing related to your health care or your medicines or your you know, surgeries. Much of this cost would simply disappear if we paid for much of our routine coverage out of our pockets. We paid for it ourselves. So that's his. you're seeing a hint at his solution. <clears throat> so society's excess cost from health insurance expenses pales next to the moral hazard. He should have used the word morale hazard there. Remember, moral hazard is illegal. That's when you intentionally uh, put a fraudulent claim in so that you can get insurance. Morale hazard is the fact that you tend to overuse insurance, you overuse a service because you're insured and the insurance is paying for it. Uh, so we tend to buy, we tend to get more coverage because we have insurance. If it was going to cost us $5,000, and that's what we're going to talk about the health savings account, if you have a health savings account, health savings account of $5,000, and that's your money, and the only way you lose it is if you spend it on health care, then you might not spend nearly as much on health care. But if you have a managed care where it only costs you $10 or $30 to go to the doctor, then you're probably going to, you're probably just going to spend it and say, well, it's only 30 bucks. Make sure I'm okay. Um, and what does that do? It makes us price incentive and insensitive. This is a big issue as well. We don't look at prices. So one of the solutions you'll notice in the rubric is make prices of, ins of healthcare transparent so that consumers start making decisions. And we'll give you some examples of some articles. There's, there's one really interesting article. I don't think it's available in San Antonio yet, but um, we'll look at it. I'll research it before we get to that article. Of, of insurance companies or certain products giving you incentive that says, hey, if you'll go to this doctor that charges $1,000 versus going to this doctor that charges $2,000, we'll, we'll pay you 50 bucks. We'll pay you 50 bucks. I mean, it's five, mi it's five miles longer drive. 
but their quality is just as good as the other doctor and they charge half as much. And insurance is covering it, so you don't care if it's $1,000 or $2,000. However, this entity tells you if, if you go to the cheaper one, we'll pay you 50 bucks to go to them. So the insurance company pays the $1,000 claim, they pay you 50 bucks, but you save them 950 bucks because they don't have to pay 2000 to the higher priced one. So how do we get to that place where consumers are actually choosing where they go based on quality and price? And that's one of the solutions is we've got to make that information available. <laughs> the informational advantage that physicians have, so one thing you see in the problem is the asymmetric inf information. Um, doctors can create their own demand. So this is a good quote for that informational advantage that doctors have and their authority that they have, because we tend to listen to what they say. Um, physicians can, to some extent, generate demand at will. They can create their own demand. So, so you see how I'm trying to fit you into this rubric. Um, hopefully you've gotten that. If not, stop right now. We're going to end the class here. Stop right now and think about how you're handling your organization for this paper. And if you're not doing it well, fix what you're doing before we go into the next few classes. Otherwise, you're going to be sitting there, you know, not listening, kind of not, not engaged. And then suddenly you've got a paper to write versus you could use this, this class time to write your paper. So stop and think about what you're doing. And as we finish up this article and go to others, I'll try to help you put it into the rubric so you'll have a great paper ready to go. Uh, right when you get to write it. And this is a very lengthy paper to write, so you want to spread it out over time, and I hope to help you with that. So we'll stop it there, and then um, we'll move and finish this article and get into some other articles uh, in the next few classes.